Hello, welcome to the Nottingham Buddhist Centre Shrine Room. Um, as part of the meditation toolkit, um, this is a, a short video introducing you to Buddhist ritual. My name is Padmasaki. I'm an order member here at the Nottingham Buddhist Centre, and I just love ritual, which is why I volunteered for this one. So some people do think of Buddhism as a rational religion. Um, so yes, we do meditate and we do study, and they're very, very important. But there's more to understanding Buddhism to really affect change than our rational minds can take in. So ritual plays a very important part in Buddhism. One of the ways Buddhism looks at the human being is as body, speech and mind. In order to affect real change, we need to bring along all of those aspects of ourselves. So we need to bring as much of ourselves onto the path as we can. And I find ritual a deeply inspiring and beautiful way to strengthen and intensify feelings of devotion that I have. It reaches beneath the conscious and contacts parts of us that respond to myths and symbols. So this enriches our lives. It allows us to express those deeper parts of ourselves that go beyond the words and the language and that go beyond our rational mind. To engage ourselves more fully, we need to engage our emotions. It's important that we are bringing our emotions into play here. Understanding something won't influence the way we lead our lives. It won't really make us change. It's only when we engage emotionally with that understanding that real change happens. And we need to free up our emotional responses. And rituals can be an extremely helpful way to help to bring those emotional responses out, externalize them. Allowing ourselves to fully experience and express whatever feelings we have of faith and devotion towards our spiritual ideas. So the word often tr that's often used is shraddha, and it's often translated as faith. But it isn't faith in the way of blind faith. It literally, shraddha means placing the heart on. So this has a very different feel to um, just a faith that you believe in something because somebody's told you. It's a real heart response to what you are hearing and what you are feeling in yourself. It's our full emotional response to a higher reality and a spiritual truth. It's important to realize, though, that we do have rituals in our lives. It's not just a Buddhist prerogative to do ritual. We have rituals about very simple things in our lives, like going to bed. Some people will be highly ritualized and they will have something to drink and then they will go and check the doors and then they'll clean their teeth. And it's that, in a way, when you get to your sleep time, there's more of you involved because you've ritualized these different things that prepare the whole of you for going to bed, for going to sleep. Even football fans, if you're going to a match as a football fan, you leave behind your individual life and world and you become, for that part of that match, part of something much bigger. You become one of the fans and you chant together and you stand together and you will your team to victory. And if you look at the news about the football now, the players are finding it quite a lot more difficult to actually play to their best without those fans. So it, it is a very powerful thing to come together and ritualize things, whether it's football, whether it's, you know, uh, going to bed, that we can actually do this. And in Buddhism, Ritual specifically is used to engage more fully with our spiritual feelings. I feel a deep sense of gratitude to the three jewels of Buddhism. The three jewels are the Buddha, the person who became enlightened and whose teaching we follow, and the Dharma, which is the teaching that he taught and which I try to follow. And the Sangha, the community of people who follow the Buddha's teaching, other people that we practice with. From this gratitude naturally comes feeling of respect and reverence. Becoming a Buddhist changed my life and so I naturally want to express my gratitude in this some way. 
the Buddha, when he was enlightened, he found that he needed something to revere. And he couldn't find a person to revere. He was enlightened. He, there was nobody else like him. But he revered the Dharma, the truth, reality. We can create rituals in simple ways. We can have a space at home where we meditate. And it can be quite simple, um, just a picture maybe of the Buddha, um, and some candles or incense. There are three traditional offerings in Buddhism, and that is um, flowers, candles, and incense. Flowers just remind us of impermanence, but they're beautiful, so they're a beautiful thing to focus on. Candles, the light that the Dharma brings to our life. Incense, the fragrance goes far beyond the little stick that's burning, and that is what the Dharma does in, in the world. We hope that we go far beyond this shrine room with the activities that we have. So when I go into my shrine room, my mind is already turning to meditation. That simple ritual of lighting candles and saluting the three jewels is part of that preparation. So when I actually sit down, it makes it much easier to go into my practice because more of me has arrived in the room. I don't have to spend a lot of time gathering bits of me that are still doing the shopping or washing up. I've already brought myself into the room. So if you go to a Buddhist class in Sri Ratna, what you will often find is that we will begin the class by saluting the three jewels. And the three jewels are represented by the shrine that's behind me. And the words we use are not English words, they're Sanskrit words. Namo Buddhaya, Namo Dharmaya, Namo Sankhaya, Namo Nama, Om, Ah, Hum. Homage to the Buddha, Homage to the Dharma, Homage to the Sangha, Homage with body, speech and mind. Puj is an Indian word meaning worship. And in Sri Ratna, there are two main pujas that are used all over. And that is a sevenfold puja, which has seven sections in it. And the shorter but very beautiful threefold puja. They consist of a series of poetic verses. And they are verses, beautiful verses of devotion. And they're usually done with others. We often come together um, and, and we try and just bring ourselves all into the room and practice together. It'll be done with call and response. So one person will lead and the rest of us will respond to that. We respond in unison. It's a lovely thing to do with people, actually. And it does have quite a powerful um, impact emotionally, I think, and a charge of energy that often still surprises me now. So in Puja, our focus is on the Buddha and the verses that we recite, we're giving, we're offering them to the Buddha. We're doing it with others and that powerful energy is because our energies become engaged. We involve ourselves fully in our body, our speech and our mind. Our body, we're there and sometimes we will make offerings, bowing to the shrine. Our speech, we're reciting the verses with it together. And our mind is focused on the Buddha. We express our gratitude and this strengthens our spiritual devotion, our feelings around the practice and the, the Buddha and our being Buddhists. It is an important shared practice and it's best, it, it's at its most powerful when it's done with a group of people. But actually, it has quite an effect if you do it on your own at home. We'll often include the chanting of mantras in, in pujas. And the mantras are the symbols of one of the enlightened figures. So it can be the Buddha, Tara, Amitabha, different figures that are in the Buddhist pantheon. Um, there's many different figures. They re represent aspects of enlightenment or represent enlightenment. They're sound symbols of a particular aspect of the enlightened mind. So mantric sound, it's both external 
we hear it, we, we chant it externally, but more importantly, it's an internal, a vibration with your, in your whole being that is connecting with that aspect of enlightenment. They're often a string of syllables. They don't maybe even have meaning. Some of them do, but that's not the important thing. They are the sound equivalent of the figure they're connected to. And they are repeated over and over in a puja. People come up to the shrine and make offerings during those mantra recitations. And it, repeating the mantra represents the actual presence of the figure, imaginatively, in the world. We bring that figure into the world through the mantra. And it also indicates the real possibility of radical transformation, the radical transformation that will be required if we too are going to manifest the qualities of enlightenment in the world. So to finish the video, I'd like to offer you the opportunity to take part in a short threefold puja with me. To prepare yourself, just find yourself a comfortable place to sit where you're not going to be disturbed and you can just absorb what's happening. The words are very beautiful, and if you want to join in, please feel free to. But if you want to just see how, what, how it feels to just experience it, let yourself be open to the experience. Don't worry if you don't immediately feel overwhelmed and with awe and wonder. It takes a while to get used to puja. Uh, I was very, very suspicious when I first came across puja. It was like, oh, what is going on? Um, it's fine, but don't give up just because you have a reaction the first time. Just try and gently come back to it and you may find something very, very beautiful happens. So I'll start by saluting the three jewels. Namo Buddhaya Namo Dharmaya, Namo Sanghaya, Namo Nama, Om Ah Hum. The Threefold Puja Opening Reverence We reverence the Buddha, the perfectly enlightened one, the shower of the way. We reverence the Dharma, the teaching of the Buddha, which leads from darkness to light. We reverence the Sangha, the fellowship of the Buddha's disciples, that inspires and guides. Reverence to the Three Jewels. We reverence the Buddha and aspire to follow him. The Buddha was born as we are born. What the Buddha overcame, we too can overcome. What the Buddha attained, we too can attain. We reverence the Dharma and aspire to follow it. With body, speech and mind, sorry. We reverence the Dharma and aspire to follow it with body, speech and mind until the end. The truth in all its aspects, the path in all its stages, we aspire to study, practice, realize. We reverence the Sangha and aspire to follow it, the fellowship of those who tread the way, as one by one we make our own commitment, an ever-widening circle, the Sangha grows.
offerings to the Buddha. Reverencing the Buddha, we offer flowers, flowers that today are fresh and sweetly blooming, flowers that tomorrow are faded and fallen. Our bodies too, like flowers, will pass away. Reverencing the Buddha, we offer candles. To him who is the light, we offer light. From his greater lamp, a lesser lamp, we light within us. The lamp of Bodhi shining within our hearts. Reverencing the Buddha, we offer incense. Incense whose fragrance pervades the air. The fragrance of the perfect life, sweeter than incense, spreads in all directions throughout the world. So that's the threefold puja, and it's just a beautiful, simple way of expressing our devotion and gratitude to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And I hope that you've got some small taste of Buddhist ritual. Thank you.